We had a hall, we had a um, post office, a drapery shop, a fire station, a police station. It was a very, very nice town for the, the time, but it was probably uh, considered uh, a bit antiquated by, by today's standards. Well, we had a, a kerosene fridge that we used to keep our food cold in. It was very efficient, but it used to smoke and it was always contrary. Other than that, we had a Coolgardie safe. A school, hospital, hotel, and yeah, I think that's all. We used to have uh, community uh, get-togethers and uh, in the hotel we'd play darts and have a beer with the boys on Friday night and, and uh, the girls used to get around doing something. We had two hours on a Tuesday afternoon to do our ironing when the generator was switched on whether the washing was dry or not. The first Christmas we spent here, uh, we were invited to various homes, but New Year we hadn't taken account of because they don't go to bed. They stay up and they drink anything at all <laughs> and everything, uh, and it turns into a fairly wild party. And the only other time we had power at night time was between six and nine o'clock at night. But in all, it was a lovely place to be. It's mid-January 1961 and Perth is in the grip of a heat wave. Temperatures soar above the century, baking the country tinder dry. Heavy rains in the summer and autumn of 1960 and a dry winter and spring mean fuel loads in the forests are high. Thousands in the city seek relief at the beaches, unaware that the worst bushfire disaster in Western Australia's history is about to strike communities south of Perth. Dwelling up, deep in the Jarrah forests 110 kilometres from Perth, is situated at the top of an escarpment. It was settled in the late 19th century by sawmillers and timber cutters, eager to exploit the Jarrah, Blackbutt and Marry in the area. In 1918, the area surrounding Dwelling Up becomes part of the state forest and the town a major centre for forestry management and research. By 1960, Timber is the third biggest income earner for the state and the town develops a reputation for blooding future leaders. When Frank Campbell takes over as divisional forest officer in Dwelling Up in September 1960, the community of forestry and sawmilling families is thriving. I was 28 when I arrived in Dwelling Up. Uh, I had left the forestry school in 1956 and had gone straight into management, so was a raw rookie when it came to fire. His wife Pam had just given birth to their son Stephen and is back in hospital with complications. His daughter is being cared for by neighbours. It's a rough start to the job. I was heavily reliant on the experience and the talent in the officers that had been here for longer periods and had worked with fire most of their working lives. But it's about to get a whole lot rougher. On Thursday, 19th of January 1961, cyclonic winds off the northwest coast produce a chain of thunderstorms that sweep down from Mundaring in the north to Manjum up in the south. At 6 pm that night, lightning strikes start 10 fires 25 kilometres from Dwelling Up. The stage is set for disaster. Jo Holland, a forestry officer's wife, living in Dwelling Up with her three kids, is at her neighbour's house with her family when the phone rings. There is fire. The men leave immediately. We were used to having fires, now our men going away. There was nothing unusual about that. Had to keep the kitchen fire going so you had a hot meal. Send them off to bed so that they could have a sleep and be ready to wake them up, to send them out, never knowing when they were going to return. Ted Cracknell is a forest ranger living in Dwelling Up with his wife Joy and their two kids. Every man is out fighting the fires. Ted is seeing weather conditions that are unusual. Fires of a night are usually been able to contain them because the heat and the wind has dropped 
and you can attack the tail fire and the flank fires. But during this period, the wind pricked up greatly and the, the temperature seemed to stay up, so it would give us no chance at all. And then they get hit again. On the Friday night, lightning starts nine more bushfires in state forests near Dwelling Up. The men fight hard to contain the 19 separate fires fuelled by gusting winds and scorching temperatures. But a major fire breaks free and tears along the Darling Range toward Dwelling Up. We had been getting reports back that we would be controlling the fires given any reasonable expectation of the weather. However, on Saturday we had some of the worst weather that I had ever seen with a heavy nor'wester and conditions which really made it quite impossible to control the fires that we had going. A fierce northwester is pushing the flames south. The fires are now six kilometres from dwelling up. That morning, when I realised things were going bad, I rang headquarters and asked for backup. But everyone has the same problem. Fires are burning across the whole of the southwest region and crews are stretched to breaking point. Frank is told he'll have to go it alone for now. At 12 o'clock, a sudden wind change turns the fires back on the men, endangering their lives. Frank orders all gangs back to dwelling up immediately to regroup. We decided it was too dangerous and pulled out the uh, crews and equipment back to dwelling up. Men come home weary, so tired and scorched they could hardly see. They had no sooner arrived back in dwelling up than the fire four kilometres north of dwelling up uh, showed up and we had to send them straight out there. But Sunday does bring some good news. Firefighting crews arrive from the north and south. Bruce Beggs was divisional forest officer before Frank. He held the position for seven years and has an intimate knowledge of the dwelling up area. I received a uh, call from my senior officer to come up and relieve Frank Campbell. I left at about 11 o'clock on that Sunday uh, to uh, travel to dwelling up. As I approached Bridgetown, north of Manjimup, and uh, about 115 kilometres from dwelling up, I looked to the north and uh, could see this uh, huge convection cloud, rather like a, a mushroom cloud uh, in the uh, distance. So I realised that we had a fire of some size. Bruce arrives at lunchtime and Frank gives him a full briefing. Frank grabs some rest and comes back on as Bruce's offsider. That night, with an extra hundred firefighters, the crews hold the fire just above dwelling up. Monday comes. Strangely, nothing seems to be out of order. It is wash day, and the women perform everyday tasks and feed the children. On the m Monday, we felt we were getting in front and uh, had uh, control of the fire. And uh, by about 10 o'clock that night, I went down to the hotel, uh, and after a couple of beers, went to bed. Fire crews battle through their fourth straight night and continue to hold the fire above dwelling up. On Tuesday, 24th of January 1961, heat wave conditions continue. The temperature climbs to 41 degrees. I was woken at five o'clock in the morning uh, and asked to come back up to the office because by that time the winds had increased quite dramatically overnight. The tropical cyclone to the north whips up strong northerly winds of 60 kilometres an hour and blows them into the southwest of the state. It is the worst possible weather. Frank Podger was set out to uh, resolve this tower and uh, he rang me to advise that uh, things were looking pretty, pretty grim on the uh, northeast road where uh, there were a number of breakaways and uh, he was concerned. Meanwhile, back in Dwelling Up, Joe's neighbour needs her help. Her son is sick and she needs Joe to drive them to the hospital in Perth. So on the uh, Tuesday morning, 
at early. We set up with my three children and her two children and we sent up to the children's hospital in Perth. Fires burning above dwelling up leap over containment lines and begin their march toward the town. Communication with the forestry department's radio in the town is cut by fire. Breaks in communication spell danger. Bruce issues a recall order. All gangs are to come back into dwelling up immediately. If he can't contact his men, he can't manage their safety. He can't make contact with all the gangs. He's not sure they all get the recall order. Roads back into dwelling up are cut by fire. Ember storms, fueled by gusting winds, start fires on the edge of town. At around four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Bruce contacted the postmistress and asked her to call people in Hollyoak then the farms around Dwelling Up uh, to evacuate and come into Dwelling Up for safety. Hollyoak and surrounding districts evacuate to Dwelling Up and the population swells to 600 people. About six o'clock, uh, the people in the hospital were evacuated in jail. And around the same time, I uh, realised things were pretty dangerous and uh, uh, I uh, contacted Pam and the kids and arranged with them to move over to Nan Hatches on the eastern side of Dwelling Up uh, and I left them there and just had to pray that they'd be safe. Gale force winds drive fire into the town. About six o'clock, Merle from over the road rang and she asked what that terrible noise was. So I went over and it was like a thousand trains coming. Homes are burning. Men race back to their wives and children. I went inside to see where Joy was and the two girls, and they weren't there, so I assumed that somebody had looked after them and the forest department was looking after them, and I could see that we were going to lose the house if it stopped, didn't stop and do something. And the sparks and everything was coming and the sky was black, even though it was only six o'clock in the afternoon. Car lights are on, but the smoke and fire make it impossible to see. The forestry came with the ute and said we'll have to leave because it's getting too dangerous. Not knowing that my husband was over here, we couldn't even see our house and I was even told our house was burnt down. So we were getting in the ute, some of the kids' hairs were catching fire so we put towels over their head. I didn't know that they were going to put a, her and the kids in the back of a ute and try and get out of town. In fact what they were doing was driving into the flames. Bruce and Frank are in head office with the radio operator. He is relaying events to Perth and Mandurah. He tells them nearly every building in town is burning. Uh, and then he said, uh, and now this place is alight and we're getting out. The sparks were uh, literally hitting you all the time when you walked outside the office. I knew that we were in serious trouble um, and I ripped the front end of my shirt and dunked it in the pack spray so that I could breathe whilst I walk down the backyard. Meanwhile, just outside dwelling up on Boddington Road, Joy and the kids are driving into a wall of fire. And we all screamed, screamed, because we were all petrified. He ended up stopping, and then he tried to turn around, but he couldn't, he stalled, so that we all got out the ute, ran all the way up this road, and we'd come here to the crossroads, and we sat here, we thought we'd be safe here, as long as the wind doesn't change. The home that I lived in, Bruce's old home, uh, was a light. So I literally stood there and watched my home burn. Uh, we decided to leave and I took Sunny Cove and we got my car. Uh, the seats were just starting to burn when we got in and drove away. I needed to find Pam and the kids and make sure that they were safe. We drove around to the uh, Oval and realised that that's where Pam and the kids would be. And uh, Pam asked me where Sue was. I realised that she was at the school and I didn't know whether the school was uh, there or not. So I was very concerned that maybe the school had burnt and that I may have lost a daughter. We're driving back that Tuesday night and near North Dandler, about half an hour from home, we could see these exploding fireballs like firecrackers in the sky over the other side of the Darling Scarp. And we said to each other, someone's copying it out there. Little did we know, it, it was our own homes going up in flames. 
The fire is at its peak. Frank risks his life to find his daughter. Sunny Cave came with me uh, and we set out to walk directly from the Oval to the school. Um, the houses along the main road were alight. Uh, McKersha's service station was the main area of, that we could see to go through to the school, um, but there were 44 gallon drums exploding either side of it. Uh, it simply made us hurry. Got back to the oval, went straight to the car, opened the door and pushed my head in to tell Pam that Sue was safe and she started to cry. We turned off at the Pinjarra Road heading up towards Dwelling Up and we could see the lights up ahead of us near the cool up turn off, the policeman flashing the lights across the road saying stop, stop, you can't go into Dwelling Up, it's all been burnt out and I said can't be, when he left there this morning and as we were talking this car came down from Dwelling Up through the smoke etc and it's one of the ladies I knew and she put her window down and was calling out most distressed that the whole town was burnt and all you could smell was burning flesh and all I could think is my husband's in there somewhere. The police tell Joe to go back to Pinjarra where they are setting up a relief centre. Meanwhile, back in Dwelling Up, Bruce gets some bad news. We'd set a missing persons desk up on the veranda of the hotel at about 3.30 that night, I found that we had over 90 names listed on it and I was very concerned as to what the future was going to hold. I went to bed for an hour and a half with strict instructions to be woken at five o'clock so that I could be composed when we went round to find the bodies. Joanne and the kids sheltered on Boddington Road until early Wednesday morning when forestry men came and took them back to Dwelling Up. And we drove down to the Oval, which would probably only be about 20 or 30 people, and we thought we were the only people left in Dwelling Up. And, um, and then uh, Ted came, and uh, he'd been, we hadn't seen him for about two days. He was that pleased to see us. And, um, and then after it all settled down, we went back home and he went to bed with his boots on on the bed with the two girls either side of me because they were exhausted. And I walked around the house all night just to make sure that, you know, everything was safe and sound. About 9am on that Wednesday morning, we heard that the men had been brought down by a truck from dwelling up and taken straight to the hospital. And when we came around the corner in the car, I could, and we could all see these men just laying on the lawn on the green grass and the trees shading them, but these men laying in rows, looked like a scene out of a war movie. We walked up and down these rows looking for our husbands and trying to identify them. It was quite emotional when we first recognised each other. I remember I got down on my knees and sort of put my arms around him. And uh, he, I said, you know, are you all right? He said, I can't see, but I'm okay. Damaged by dust, smoke and flying embers, many people's eyes will be affected for weeks. Holocaust Inferno Fireball. Who can adequately describe the scene here dwelling up today? Last night's fire wreaked devastation over the whole township area. People here are still surprised and shocked at what happened last night. They are still not really aware of what did occur. 
The 1961 dwelling up bushfires happened as a result of weather conditions, in particular hot, dry, windy weather conditions. And leading into the bushfires, we had below average rainfall through the, the winter and early spring, uh, together with large areas of flammable vegetation that had accumulated in the forest. And that cocktail was um, ignited by a string of lightning strikes as a result of the cyclonic activity uh, in the north of the state. Neil Burrows, a leading bushfire scientist, has spent 30 years researching the behaviour and impact of bushfires on forests in the southwest region of Western Australia. Uh, the dwelling up wildfires were somewhat unique. In fact, some of the research that I've done um, where I've investigated fire scars in Jarrah trees as old as 400 years revealed that the dwelling up wildfires were the most intense wildfires that these 400 year old trees had ever experienced. From January to March of that year, nearly 350,000 hectares had been burnt in the southwest. Dwelling up was all but destroyed. 116 homes, two service stations, three shops, the mill, the hospital, the church, the post office, the town hall and the forestry headquarters had been burnt to the ground. 74 motor vehicles incinerated. Nearby timber villages of Hollyoke and Nangabrook were wiped out. The damage bill reached 35 million and hundreds of people were injured. But not one person had lost their life. Alan MacArthur notes in his report to the Royal Commission into the fires that the fact that no lives were lost speaks highly of the ability of the foresters in charge to recognise the dangers involved in blow-up conditions. The fire control officers at the time called the firefighters out of the bush uh, and brought them into safe refuge areas. MacArthur also praises the early action taken to warn people living in the path of the fire. Dwelling up fire control officers um, very early on in the piece uh, had people evacuate from settlements such as Hollyoak. And before the fires hit dwelling up, the firefighters transported all residents to safe shelter at the hotel, the oval and the school. Craig Hines, Director of Country Operations for the Fire Emergency Services Authority in Western Australia, believes there is a key lesson to be learnt from the dwelling up disaster. The decision to stay or go with the onset of a major fire such as the dwelling up fire is something that uh, certainly has to be made well in advance of the fire. Have a plan, work out whether your property is physically prepared, has a circle of safety, um, are you mentally prepared? Um, you know, are you physically capable? Do you have young people in your family or elderly people, infirm people? And so make that decision and, uh, and either stay or go early. Money and messages of support flood in. The deeply shocked Western Australian community immediately organise a massive relief effort. Many have lost everything. And for them, the donation of food and clothing is something they still remember today. Our house had burnt down and we had lost everything that was in it. We literally only had the clothes we stood up in and uh, a few nappies for the baby. The dwelling up bushfires of 1961 was a turning point in terms of the way we, we managed fire in southwest Western Australia. The lessons learned from the dwelling up bushfires and the recommendations from the Royal Commission greatly influenced uh, fire management in terms of the, the right sort of equipment that we need to fight these fires, better communication systems, um, better organisation systems. It increased prescribed burning programs. It led to an increase in the research and development of bushfires in Western Australia, leading to safer communities. For a fire you need uh, heat, you need oxygen and you need fuel and there's only one of those three that you can get rid of. Uh, we can't control the weather conditions, but we can control the fuel build-up. And the most environmentally friendly way in which we can do this is by using fire itself. Since 1961, prescribed burning has assisted fire crews in containing the spread of major wildfires. One such example occurred on the 45th anniversary of the Dwelling Up fires. I'm standing in Jarrah Forest, about 20 kilometres south of Dwelling Up. Uh, on this side of the road, we had a wildfire through here about a week ago. Prior to the wildfire, this forest hadn't been burnt for 20 years, so it carried very heavy fuel loads. The heavy fuel loads made it difficult for the firefighters to control the fire. 
Fortunately though, on the other side of the road, there had been some prescribed burning carried out last spring, which meant that the fuels were very light. In fact, the prescribed burn stopped this wildfire and enabled the firefighters to dispatch their resources to other parts of the fire. Many residents of Dwelling Up returned soon after the fires. But for some, it takes a few more weeks. The greatest disappointment I had was the, uh, the fact that the, the crews that I'd worked with over a number of years uh, and had proven themselves to be very reliable, dedicated uh, employees uh, had been overrun by fire and uh, were virtually had their tail between their legs had uh, uh, been, uh, they'd lost the battle. Coming back into dwelling up was a bit traumatic. We could see the devastation of the town and I suppose I was mostly affected by what could have happened and that was uh, the loss of life, uh, including uh, wife and ch children, uh, and the uh, destruction of an organisation that I worked for and believed in. Uh, that was the hardest. period following the fire was, of course, very stressful. My wife had been sick during that time. Uh, the stress of trying to look after the, the young children and uh, just the memories were all a little bit too much. About four weeks after uh, the fire, uh, I decided that I, it was time to, to make the trip down to Dwelling Up. A friend of mine from the department had driven me back to Dwelling Up um, Frank Podger by name, uh, and as we were going up the hill I found all the emotions of, of what I would experience when I got back to Dwelling Up were a bit much for me, um, suggested Frank pull over, which he did. We started to talk over the feelings that we had because he also had been through the fire and had similar feelings, um, and it was in talking about those fears, uh, background experiences, expectations of what we would see when we got to Dwelling Up uh, that decided us and we decided to turn around and go back to Perth. Frank Campbell returned soon after and was responsible for the rebuilding of Dwelling Up. He was Divisional Forest Officer for the next four years and formed bonds with the community that are still with him today. Bushfires uh, such as a dwelling up wildfire uh, can leave lasting impressions on people. They're quite traumatic events and in fact uh, I liken it to the sorts of traumas that one might go through during, during a war. Uh, similarly, people that volunteer to fight bushfires, uh, it's as dangerous in many ways as volunteering to fight a war. Yeah, that, that was a sad time because we knew they'd lost everything and we used to have little afternoon teas and games in a hall to have little gifts to give them. It was a real lovely community and everybody was looking after the ones that had lost their homes. And, uh, you you could, couldn't help but feel sorry for them and felt uh, rather depressed yourself as a result of that. But uh, they, they sprung back, they, they eventually came back very well indeed. And, uh, they uh, just showed the, the calibre of the people concerned.